I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and I am speaking with James Gay Rees, the executive producer of the docuseries 1971, The Year That Music Changed Everything, which is streaming on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask is, um, did, did, the, did the director, uh, Asif uh, Kapadia, have any special connection to the music of 1971? Because uh, he was actually born the following year, 1972. Yeah, I know. No, it was just pure coincidence. I mean, sadly, I was born a few years earlier in 1967. So um, I've got that. But uh, no, you know, we have a company together. We've made a lot of films together. And um, it was a book I found. And I was immediately taken by the book and the proposal in the book. And uh, we just went for it. And uh, it was so exciting to have it coming out on Friday. So you know, one of the interesting things about, uh, I think probably the most startling thing about this is it feels like it's almost all archival footage and archival interviews as well. Uh, what were the efforts that went into putting together this eight-part docuseries? It was pretty vast, to be honest with you, because, you know, when you're basically, you know, the, pr the premise of the book is that it's the greatest year in the history of rock and pop music. And so it is an extraordinary year. Obviously, it's subjective, but it's an extraordinary year by anybody's standards, because every major artist, black, white, male, female, solo, solo acts, rock bands, they all, almost all of them produced their masterwork that year. So we just started thinking, you know, what happened? You know, what led to this extraordinary artistic output this year? Um, the music is fantastic as well, you know, it's a, it's a complete gift to work with. But then we started looking, taking a deeper look at the, that moment in society and realised it was a very sort of tumultuous and very pivotal year in the sense that the 60s had come to this kind of crashing end with Kent State, Altamont, Charles Manson and the Beatles splitting up December 1970. And so that kind of, all that optimism in the 60s was replaced by the golden age of paranoia, Nixon, you know, bugging the White House and Vietnam in full effect. And, you know, what was it, what was in the water that led all these artists to create such an extraordinary body of music? And then, so yeah, it just became this huge undertaking. You know, we realised it was a vast story. It's, you know, the book is, 12 months, you know, but it's very strictly which music comes out month after month. And it doesn't go very deeply into the society, societal background. Um, but what became apparent to us is that all these different artists reacted in very different ways to the end of the 60s. Some of them ran off to very expensive villas in the south of France that took as much heroin as they possibly could. And some of them wrote protest music about what was going on in Vietnam. So you had this massive range of responses to the end of the 60s. And so we tried to make it sort of music documentary with a difference in the sense that, you know, we made Amy, which, you know, was trying to really understand what was going through that person's head, you know, to, to create her art. And this was really just trying to work out what was going on in society. And um, we'd found these themes. So we tried to make the music, it definitely wasn't behind the music, you know, it was much more of a, how does society, how does society and music really interact in that very pivotal, pivotal year whereby society informs the music and the music likewise informs society. So uh, it's, we're trying to make it slightly different to the other music docs that are out there. How long did it take to, uh, from the actual uh, beginning of uh, the of Asif's uh, uh, decision to make this movie to the actual completion did it take? Well, Asif is a series director, so there were two directors underneath him who did four episodes each. So he was like the showrunner almost on it. Um, but, you know, we probably, from the time we optioned the book to this Friday, it's probably about four years. You know, it's uh, six hours of archive. You know, we've made a lot of archive movies with Amy and Senna and, you know, stuff like that and um, Diego Maradona. But they're, they're hard movies to make, but they're only one human being story. This is the story of the world in one year. I mean, you can take it so many different directions. So, you know, it's a huge distillation. So, you know, thousands of hours of archive before you settle on the six hours you're going to use. But we had a great team of um, archive producers and um, lots of different editors working on it. Um, and then all the directors and the executive producers all chipping in. So, you know, it was, a, it was, it was a very, very ambitious project. As I said, it wasn't a straightforward, you know, Keith came in with his guitar, wrote down the chord, and then I picked up the mic. It wasn't that sort of documentary. It's like what was going on in the world. So, and it's, you know, it's a subjective analysis, you know. Uh, was the dialogue of any of the voices in the film from interviews that were done specifically for this documentary, or was it all completely archival? No, we did hundreds of interviews. So we've done lots and lots of interviews. We're just trying to, you know, blend them in as much as we could. I mean, I think it's interesting because it was it's 50 years ago, right? So unfortunately, a lot of those artists are no longer with us. 
So you have to use the archive, but some of them are obviously still around. And we interviewed a lot of people. So we interviewed a lot of the, the you know, the artists themselves, the people in and around them. And then, you know, uh, big uh, music journalists at the time, even people who worked for Nixon we interviewed, you know, so a real range of characters. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is, you know, it's, um, it's very much the case sometimes, not always, but the interview that that person gave in 1971 is obviously in the moment. And 50 years later, it's a very different type of interview. So getting those, getting, you know, old interviews to um, intercut with, you know, um, contemporary interviews is, is tricky. So hopefully it's, it blends pretty well, but it's, uh, they're definitely different, different, different animals. Was there any interview that you felt like that, like, like, I, I, I guess uh, blew you away or like was like really startling to hear uh, this person's answer to uh, a, a person's answer to a specific question of any of the interviews that were done? Yeah, I mean, a couple that spring to mind. I mean, Chrissy Hind was amazing. You know, the series opens with her because the series, the series opens with Kent State, you know, the shootings at Kent State, which leads, you know, Neil Young to write, write Ohio, obviously. And that's like the first protest song that takes us into the series. And Hearing her first-hand account of being a student at Kent State was pretty, pretty extraordinary, obviously, because she's never spoken about it before. So that was incredible. Um, and then, you know, we did an interview with Elton John, which was just inc was equally incredible because, you know, he can remember literally everything he did that year and the year before and the year after. I mean, just the inc incredible memory of exactly, you know, the other musicians he was listening to. You know, he literally can recount blow by blow, getting off the plane at LAX for the first time, driving straight to Tower Records, which records he bought, which hotel he stayed in, what he had for dinner. I mean, it's insane. I can't remember what I did yesterday. Do you know what I mean? So I was so impressed by that. And um, yeah, so, you know, lots and lots and lots. I mean, they were all brilliant in their own ways, but those two particularly stood out for me. So I'm, I'm uh, curious, just from your own personal standpoint, uh, What's your favorite music that got, what's some of your favorite music that got highlighted by this series? You know, I genuinely love a, a really, a lot of it. You know, I've got quite broad musical taste, but I think, you know, and it's not exactly a surprising choice, but what's going on by Marvin Gaye? I mean, you know, that, that record will, will still be played in 50 years time. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's on the radio here in the UK all the time anyway. And it has been since it was made 50 years ago because it's just such a untouchable classic piece of work. And the message in that music is still as relevant today as it was then. And that's, you know, that's the really sort of um, extraordinary thing about the series. As we were making it, a lot of the messages and a lot of the issues that people were t protesting about in 1971 are still with us. You know, it was the year the Greenpeace was founded. You know, today you have Black Lives Matter. You know, you had the Attica Prison Massacre in 1971. You know, in some ways things have got better, but in some ways things haven't got better enough, you know. And, you know, is that old cliche brings to mind, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, you know, we haven't made as much progress as we think we have. And when we were making this series, we were going, my God, you know, the, the, the problems we're dealing with today, the warning lights were flashing in 1971, but we just, we haven't dealt with these things. And hence we're in the pickle that we're in, in some respects today. So, um, sorry, that was a very, very off, off piece to answer, but yes. Yeah, so what's going on, I think is just, I mean, it's a beautiful record, but it's also so affecting still. And uh, I'm a big Bowie fan, so I love the fact that Bowie has such a seminal journey in 71. You know, um, he had such a great journey starting slightly, you know, he's slightly lost, doesn't really know where to go. He goes to the States for the first time in 71, writes Hunky Dory and Ziggy Stardust, and then, you know, drops Ziggy Stardust on the world, you know, and the world will never be the same at the end of that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just to name but a few, you know, I also love the female singer-songwriters like Carol King, Tapestry, Joni Mitchell wrote Blue. I mean, they're all, that's the thing. There's so much amazing music that year. It's hard to choose. And uh, do you feel like, um, uh, I'm trying to think of how the best way to phrase this is, do you feel like uh, there's uh, that, because uh, it feels like back then music was the uh, medium to go through when doing protests and there were other mediums available, but music seemed to be the go-to. Do you think music is still the go-to or do you think other mediums have taken the lead on being the rebellious art forms of the modern day? Yeah, I think it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, I think, listen, there's obviously a lot of great music made 
every year and every month. You know, it's not like the you know, the point of the series is not to say everything was so much better than than it is now because obviously you know everything's evolved, right? And uh, there's loads of great music being made today. I mean, there's no doubt that a lot of great music was made in 71, and that's why we're still listening to it. But um, but I think that you know the world was a simpler place then. There was no social media. I think the album was like your newspaper in some ways. You know, when John Lennon wrote Imagine, you know, it was affecting people, do you know what I mean? In a very direct way, people were taking the message from that and, you know, it was really landing on them. And um, you know, as I said, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, and, you know, there's a whole host of other, you know, The Last Poets, you know, there's a lot of Gil Scott Heron in the series. Um, you know, these guys were writing with a very specific aim. They were trying to move the needle, you know. And I don't think music does that so much today. I mean, I think hip hop did, but maybe not so recently. I mean, you know, the power of Public Enemy was, uh, they peaked, a, I mean, I love Public Enemy, right? But that was, you know, Fight the Power was, I don't know, 20 years ago. So it's, um, I think the models changed a lot in music and I don't think it's necessarily there as a talk of protest now. Um, maybe it needs to be again. And maybe that's one of the, hopefully one of the takeaways from the series is that it, it can maybe inspire people to use music as a protest because when it works, it really works. Um, and God knows there's enough to protest about today in the right way. But, you know, it's, um, it'd be great if music had a slightly more significant role to play. But listen, it's not, doesn't, you know, not all music has to be protest music. It, it can serve lots of different functions, obviously. And I think what we're seeing now potentially is that music, a lot of musicians seem to be talking about mental health, which is equally valid, right? Especially given what we've all been through. But it feels like that seems to underpin a lot of what people are saying with their music at the moment, which is very, very, you know, it's just great, obviously. Um, but yeah, social media and everything else means that there's so much, you know, competition for brain space and attention that, um, you know, as the father of a 20 year, of a 20 year old and a 16 year old girl, you know, trying to get their attention for longer than five minutes is difficult, right? Because they've got so many different, you know, inflection points, but, um, but you know, you can try. Well, uh, James, thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to talking with you uh, at our panel in just a little bit. Thank you very much.